Budak. Um, I'm a former executive committee member of CDN, uh, and also up until recently, I worked in the Green European Foundation. Uh, so yeah, I'm re representing all of these flags that are behind us. Um, yeah, today we're going to talk about energy in this final session. Um, however, uh, since I see that people are getting a bit sleepy, maybe before the dinner, we thought that it's only appropriate that for the energy session, we have a little energizer before we start. So uh, I'd like to ask everyone to stand in the middle of the room. Okay, uh, and let's do it like this. Um, we're going to make a little line uh, on this axis, and whoever stands here where Jenya and I are right now, that means that you agree completely with the statements that I'm about to say, and if you stand all the way there at the bar, that means that you disagree completely. And basically, we are going to have two sentences. So yeah, you position yourself according to whether you agree or not. Uh, so it's clear, yeah, if you agree 100% you stand here, if you disagree 100% you stand there. Uh, and the first sentence uh, is, the more renewable energy sources my country implements, the more securities from external threats. Okay, I see that we agree very much, but there's also a question, or no. <laughs> okay, uh, the second one might be a bit more uh, split uh, for the people, and the second sentence is, uh, we need a diverse mix of energy sources, including tran transition uh, energy sources like gas and nuclear energy to achieve energy security. So we need a diverse mix of energy sources, including uh, transition fuels like gas and nuclear to achieve energy security. Okay, so we literally made the line <laughs> from 100% disagree to 100% agree. So I think that this will be something interesting also uh, for our speakers to reflect on later in the session. Um, and the final uh, sentence, which also might help you uh, yeah, learn a bit more about your perceptions, is my country is doing enough in achieving um, renewable energy transition. <laughs> well, didn't even need to finish that one. <laughs> okay, and I see most people are heading to the disagree part. So there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be learned, uh, no pressure, Jenya <laughs> and Manana later on. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Hopefully everyone woke up a bit more uh, and I would invite you to take your seats, uh, maybe uh, in the front part, but uh, before you sit down, uh, try not to sit down where you were before, but we're going to sit down uh, as though we're recreating a uh, map of Europe. And this part, maybe Jenya can explain how to do. Okay, so we are aware that here's people from uh, like uh, West Europe until Caucasus. Uh, so let's have uh, here the West and here the East. So whatever you think is your country, you can just like sit on the chair, which is what like represent uh, where you're from. Uh, South is here and, uh, yeah, south and north. West, east, south, north. Mm -hmm. Yep.
Yeah, you can sit on it. Doesn't mean like the West is <laughs> totally separate. So you can just we're just trying to mix a little bit people and. <laughs> Okay, uh, interesting to see also what we perceive as West and East, since we weren't very specific. And also nice to see that a bunch of people were forced uh, to be jumbled together. Um, yeah, okay, so thank you for being very cooperative in this uh, introduction to the session. Um, and yeah, basically, um, maybe to start with a bit more um, on what we're going to be talking about in this session, um, we're going to be talking about energy and its implications to our societies and um, yeah, to geopolitics um, and kind of reflect on some very current and relevant trends right now. Um, and before we get into that, I wanted to quickly reflect on um, how the Greens um, in Europe have been talking about energy. Uh, and I believe that there has been kind of a progression uh, in this sense, from seeing energy um, just as an area where we can uh, make this transition to renewable energy sources, zero carbon uh, sources, as a way to achieve our climate goals. Um, and kind of moving on from this very base, um, uh, base proposition, base setting, um, we moved on to this concept of just transition, understanding that okay, actually energy, the way we handle energy, the way that we um, yeah, make systemic changes in this area, it has a very clear effect on people's jobs, on, people li on people's livelihoods. Um, yeah, when you close a coal plant, people lose jobs and we need to address this um, as, as political forces also. Um, and kind of, I would say the latest realization is also geopolitical, understanding that uh, fossil fuels um, uh, fossil fuels also uh, allow countries to uh, promote their weapons industries. Um, and on the flip side, um, energy uh, related sanctions have uh, a very big geopolitical um, potential as well. Um, and how, what the scale of the influence is depends on uh, how they're implemented. So uh, that's kind of a quick reflection on um, yeah how the greens have um, yeah changed their changed their attitudes and their views of energy um, and hopefully we hear a bit more uh, kind of from uh, from the experts in this area so uh, today today we're uh, joined by um, manana from uh, bankwatch uh, who's working on democratization of human rights um, and she's going to um, uh, start um, today with kind of a um, uh, reflection on more general interconnections of energy, climate uh, and conflict. Uh, and so that will be the first part uh, of the panel and then we're going to move on uh, to Genia from whom you've already heard, um, who's going to talk a bit more about uh, about uh, kind of global energy perspectives, energy trends that are uh, that are happening right now, um, and and then in the second part of the panel, final part of the panel, we move on to a short workshop. So um, we're going to start with uh, Manana, who's joining us online, and I think you can see uh, her as well. So I give the floor to you. Um, it's interesting to see how the young uh, greens are uh, redistributing themselves from the west to east uh, uh, Europe. And uh, they tr actually, where from I want to really start my in intervention is that um, the application of the energy in geographical terms are really, really very important because, uh, and if we take the Central and Eastern Europe, you know, from Caucasus to the Baltic countries, we will see that in each country there is something like preferential, uh, which the people are, 
using as the the forms of the energy people are using, but the same is up, applicates to the old member states. And if you will go everywhere in the world, you know, and energy really have the implication of the people's life and uh, how we live. Uh, is very much defined by the energy we are consuming and, and we are understanding what we are consuming. And if we speak about the uh, coal mines in Serbia or oil extraction in Azerbaijan or the high large dam in Georgia, um, Estonia, like for... Uh, Latvians putting the wind farms in the forests. Everywhere, at the end of the day, we have the impacts on our society. It doesn't matter it comes through the impact on the biodiversity and protected areas, or it comes directly uh, society in terms of affordability of the energy, uh, access to the energy, access to the water, access to the land. All these issues are very much interconnected. But this is one part of the story because um, for a long time we have been used uh, uh, for having the energy uh, like mainly as a fossil fuel. And we have been mainly concerning about the price of this fossil fuel and um, maybe sometimes about the environmental impact, but uh, nothing unfortunately has been changed. Even now after the Russia's invasion in Ukraine, we see that the suction, uh, sanctions on the oil is still not implemented. And now negotiations is not, only about the marine oil, not about the pipeline oil, plus the gas is still recognized as the transition fuel with the nuclear. So there is so many things which is in, in, in the energy ease. And if we are truly speaking about this transformation, it's not just changing the sum of the fossil fuel, nuclear and unsustainable renewable with so-called sustainable renewable, which is wind and solar. But it's about to ask ourselves the question for whom this energy going, for what this energy going, and what we really transforming. Because if we are what we are transforming in case of the fossil fuels, when we say we don't want any more the uh, oil and gas from Russia. Do we are do we want this oil coming from Algeria, Iran, Saudi, Azerbaijan? Uh, do there is substitution even for the short term? You know, are we still okay with the Commission's encouragement of the Western Balkans to have more gas pipeline, uh, gas infrastructure, which was not there before? Or we are really thinking how to ensure that this energy we are consuming is um, really uh, sustainable and it, it, it's really, really, how to say, it's not really based on somebody's tragedy because with this fossil fuels um, uh, thing, we somehow accepted that oil regimes and gas regimes are supporting the dictatorship regimes and we never really addressing that issue because there is lots of the different uh, studies about the oil cores there but there is also studies how the oil regimes have been easy the for dictators to keeping the their dictatorship and uh, and there is really significant uh, time which the oil regimes have been gifting because they uh, for, for the oil rich countries. And uh, the study says that if normally the, the dictators without oil can be overturned like in five years when they try to become dictatorships in the oil countries, this goes up to 11, but if you already have the established dictatorship regime, it's the oil regimes are prolonging that from to, uh, up to from 10 to 20, 30 year. So this is half of the, our, our life. So what we are actually doing, we are somehow depriving those people uh, 
the right to develop in a way they want because our addiction to the fossil fuels or addiction to the nuclear fuel or addiction to the coal or addiction or, or any different type of the things because at the end if we not just transform I don't know how many of you remember that there was this huge project which they tried to sell for a year, which was called Desertic, when they tried to construct the solar in the uh, in the Africa in the Sahara Desert, and it was called, and then provide this energy to the EU. Uh, these are things which I I want to name it, but. In general, we also there is also the people who are living there, and these people are then deprived to the land and to the water, like it was happening in the case of the fossil fuels. So if we are really serious about the transformation as this, we really need to think about ourselves as vulnerable group of the people who really needs the access to the energy, not just to waste this energy and do all this luxury, but really ensure our normal life, but also thinking about those people who may we deprive if we are sitting different type of the addiction. So I will stop here and um, I, I don't want to speak a lot, but I'm really happy to answer your questions, uh, how all these things are going together because energy if if we speak about the energy sector this is the most problematic sector from the human rights perspective it, like it's the same like the mining so energy and the mining are most human rights uh, violations uh, full of the human rights violations and full of the uh, uh, deaths of the human rights and environmental defenders, uh, these sectors. Unfortunately, last three years, the global witness shows that uh, in energy and the mining sector, this death threat to the environmental and human rights activists coming to the e Europe. And this is also the thing which we need to think how much these conflicts we are created uh, through our addiction to the oil, doesn't matter it will be Azerbaijan and its impact or, on Armenia or, uh, um, or how our addiction impacts the Algeria and Iran and everything, you know. Uh, we, we really need to think about the energy sector, not just about simply replacement some of the solar power plants somewhere, uh, the fossil fuels with, some, with the solar power plants somewhere, but really think how we are really using the energy in sustainable way, you know? So, and then the transformation will happen. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, very insightful contribution. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely very interesting to hear um, this perspective on yeah, how we're very much systemically defined by the energy that we produce and basically um, yeah, the connections of the energy sector and human rights and how, okay, if we want an energy transition, it's not only yeah, changing the ratios, I guess, of, um, of the types of energy we consume, but looking at it very intersectionally. So, um, yeah, thank you again very much for that. I would propose um, we give the floor to Jenny now and then um, at the end of the discussion, uh, we take a couple of questions, um, if, yeah, if there are any. Is that cool? okay with you, Jenny? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I would speak from the perspective of Ukrainian and current situation, what's happening like, and why we are actually raising this question about fossil fuel and how it's effect uh, as I mentioned in previous presentation so Russia is having like a 40 percent of state budget from the fossil fuel so that's why there is so many discussion about that uh, in the EU and actually like my organization whenever I've worked uh, on the international level usually like we have worked with international stakeholders trying to influence like Ukrainian government 
but we never tried to do it like uh, international, uh, like other countries trying to influence. And now we see this as a threat because um, <coughs> Russia is going to find like some some other partnership in uh, in uh, in the world. Like if you, for example, finally would put uh, embargo on the fossil fuel, that they can find others who would not be so strict in. I don't know, democracy view and uh, others. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Russia is a uh, petrol state and 40% is, so you can see like how huge part is this. So uh, uh, all this regime is uh, actually stand on the fossil fuel. Russia is exporting oil, gas, coal. Uh, is some part of the coal is actually coming now from Donbass. So they occupied the Ukrainian territory and now selling our coal to uh, to other countries and plus nuclear and uh, actually nuclear is even not on the table of the discussion of embargo so there is for example US and UK who like very quick put embargo on uh, oil and gas like I guess it was easier because UK is dependent on like nine percent and US I think even don't have any dependence on Russia uh, but the nuclear, the nuclear for US, for example, is very uh, important, and uh, they like uh, try to forget about that part and uh, didn't mention that actually uh, there is another source to actually like influence the Russian regime. It's nuclear, uh, so there is no end uh, in uh, at the EU level. There is also not such discussion. Uh, even though like uh, Finland, for example, also depends on Russia because Russians built uh, their nuclear power plant stations. So uh, it's another question, but uh, now we're trying to at least like uh, push uh, with like uh, coal, which is already at the table. Uh, oil is uh, partly, and until the end of the year, EU is planning to cut like 90% of uh, oil, which is like for us as Ukrainians, it's not enough. Uh, because it means like next uh, six months, uh, sorry, uh, next six months, like uh, Russia is going to receive like a huge amount of money. So it's. Uh, I think I made this screenshot yesterday. So uh, at, as at yesterday, Russia already received uh, 60 billion euro for the fossil fuel. Uh, even though, like uh, for example, the call they put in fifth uh, package uh, of sanction, and it was months and a half ago. Uh, the sanction would start to work in August. Uh, yeah, in August, uh, and in oil, they're going. They're planning to stop in the end of the year. So it means like until the end of the year, they are going to give the money to Russia. And because of the war, actually, the prices raise a lot. Uh, so they receiving like. Um, uh, uh, during the last uh, like six months, let's say uh, they received like three times more money than last year for the same period. So uh, they pay a lot. Um, and it's mean like this money can like finance the war. Russia can buy some tanks and continue to kill this uh, like uh, kill Ukrainians. And this I uh, just uh, wanted to show like uh, it's on uh, 2021. Uh, so it's estimate Russian military budget. It's uh, 60 billion, and estimate amount of EU fossil payment to Russia. So actually, it's a huge one. And uh, when the war began, it was a, a big difference, actually. So of course, the EU support us a lot. And without that support, we probably like be in much worse situation than we, we have now. But compared that finance that Russia is receiving now from uh, EU for the fossil fuel, uh, Ukraine is get nothing. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's like not compatible, and that's why it's important like to find a solution, quick solution to stop this, to not give money to the Russia like now. So at least they they can't like continue the war, they can't continue the propaganda inside the country, uh, and so on. It's uh, what I already mentioned. So uh, what you already done? So they put a ban on coal import, uh, and it's going to stop in uh, just in August. Uh, but uh, the coal, it wasn't like uh, the biggest uh, part where like Russia given uh, like earning money. 
the biggest part is oil and gas. It depends on the season, so if it's heating system, the gas is like uh, they have a lot, and if it's not heating, so if uh, when the war begin, uh, there has been like uh, the calculation started, so Russia received a lot of money for the gas. So now it's switched to the oil because like heating uh, stopped. But still, like uh, EU, for example, is having plan to um, field uh, their storage for the 90% until October or something like that. And of course, it would be like from Russian gas. So in, until October, like Russia would receive a huge amount of money, even though like the last year when Russia like threatened the whole Europe, or when they just didn't give the gas to EU, it, it didn't like push uh, Europe to change something, to find a solution. And uh, only now, you know, when the war begins, so they started to look for the solution. They're looking for other uh, <coughs> resources, partners. Uh, but what's uh, surprising that they are still, even though that they have a green deal, uh, new, uh, like everybody accepted that the, the climate change is happening and we need like urgency act and so on. Um, uh, the rapid uh, development of uh, renewables energy efficiency is still not at the table. Uh, and like uh, it's a clear solution to actually uh, like be decentralized, not to be dependent on uh, fossil fuel on any countries or any dictatorship. Um, uh, uh, countries or regimes and still uh, EU is for example is looking for other opportunities to find like uh, this uh, gas or the oil from just other countries or um, Venezuela or somewhere else uh, so I it's a like uh, my organization and uh, we're part of the climate action network uh, who like I don't know for many years fight against fossil fuel like we try to explain that what kind of uh, threat uh, the fossil fuel can bring us in the future with the climate change now we're like done because of the fossil fuel in Ukraine and it's for us it's like a clear one urgent reason why we need to stop use fossil fuel like it's f <coughs> uh, actually um, the <coughs> message is for Ukraine uh, the same as for you uh, because in Ukraine for example they um, signed a, an agreement to build new nine uh, nuclear reactor uh, reactors which is like surprisingly when we have occupied its nuclear power plant station why we doing such decisions? Uh, so we are still like keep working, even though like we are advocating to ban a fossil fuel like uh, in EU and uh, in Asia. We also like keep monitoring and advocating in in Ukraine, where is like still a lot work to do. Uh, this uh, graph is showing like uh, the share of gas supply from Russia, so it's uh, the, the country who depends a lot on uh, Russian gas, and some of them is actually like highly not supporting the idea of embargo, put embargo on gas. I actually don't know in what stage the discussion like so they all been implemented, even though like they tried to put like, a full embargo, but in the end because Hungary. I uh, didn't support this, uh, so the final version is uh, Slovakia, Hungary and Czech Republic uh, could like still buy uh, oil from Russia. Uh, <coughs> the gas, uh, I've been months ago in Brussels and had a meeting and they told that okay if the full embargo on oil would be like uh, supported so the, with the gas would be easier. And uh, I don't see it now, like uh, how the process would go forward. And here on these graphs, we can see who really depends on um, gas. And some countries is like highly depend, like from 100 until like 6 percent. But it's Georgia. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, other countries like uh, EU, even though like in 2014 uh, uh, the occupation, the war happened, uh, actually the dependencies rise a lot for, for the last eight years. And who is actually uh, uh, not supporting the embargo? It's Austria, it's uh, Greece, if I'm right, um, Hungary, of course, uh, and uh, 
Italy, France, and uh, Germany. Germany, who is also depends. And what's interesting with uh, Germany that um, in the communication there is a lot like it. It would like. Uh, uh, crash our economy, it would like have super negative effect on us and so on, but there is no economy proof that it's actually really going to happen and there is a lot of proof that the uh, Russian lobby is working in Germany. Uh, they're spending a lot of money to like uh, still leave the uh, gas and EU taxonomy, so the country would still continue depends on, on, on the resources, on gas, and like probably would also depend on, on Russian gas. There is like some uh, estimation that uh, fully EU can stop depends on uh, the fossil fuel from Russia until tw uh, 2025 or 2027, uh, which is not quick enough. Uh, and uh, there is like a lot of solution to do it quicker, but there is no uh, policy, uh, political will to do it. And uh, I don't know, did somebody participate in the uh, Council of European Green Party here? But uh, somebody told me that uh, somebody made an example that uh, when the COVID happened uh, in two years, everybody told that there is n no chance that the vaccine would be fine like in uh, five or ten years as usually it's it been as, as example and it happened like in two years and with renewables and energy efficiency when it's actually developing for so many years uh, it could be even easier there just should be a political will that is uh, not happening now uh, here's another graph that uh, gas embargo would hit Russian harder. Uh, you can see the percentage and like uh, some other example that can also like affect uh, Russia, Russian economy. Uh, there is like a lot of calculation, estimation, resources. Uh, somebody saying that the gas would affect a lot. Somebody saying the oil would actually affect a lot. Um, but the clearly that uh, everything should be like banned, and after it would really affect and uh, like hit Russia so much, so they would not have a chance to continue the war. Uh, here's like some information also how world re react on Russian actions. So China and Turkey, uh, they still like work with Russia. South Korea didn't express any willingness to actually stop uh, work with uh, Russia, and India, India even like increased their oil imports. So that's why we actually work with Asia because we see that. Russia is just going to Asia, so it means they're going to have like the same money to continue the same what they did like uh, in Ukraine and actually in many other countries in Moldova, in Georgia, in Iran. Uh, so it's important to to stop it. And uh, Japan, who is actually like uh, from one side is supporting us uh, from and they like um, announced about phase out, but still they didn't make like a clear deadline when, when they're going to stop it. So it's maybe in five, maybe in 10, maybe in 20 years, so maybe even like in months, hopefully. And uh, here is uh, uh, also graphs uh, about like um, so EU is put uh, oil embargo, but uh, still like uh, people are using oil, so they need to have it like from other countries or uh, so you can see uh, from where the chance uh, EU can buy this oil. So it's Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Iran, Iraq, Russia again, Kuwait. Uh, and uh, other many countries who is actually um, affecting like the human rights a lot. There is uh, so just to switch to another country, it would not solve a problem. Uh, and it's clear that we need like decrease the consumption of oil, uh, like uh, be more efficient in using uh, these nature resources uh, to actually. Uh, stop the situation in, in the whole world to not prevent any similar I in the future. Yeah, that's all. Um, thank you for that. 
feels a bit weird talking to you <laughs> through a microphone like this at this distance. Um, yeah, it, it was very interesting uh, to see this kind of an approach. Um, yeah, to showing what the situation is right now and to seeing the facts uh, very nicely supported by actual numbers. I think it really is very enlightening to see kind of on a graph how much money the EU, for example, gives Russia um, compared to their military budget and to see like, ah, okay, actually Europe is funding very much um, this conflict that then it's trying on the other hand to prevent or uh, like stop with sanctions and it's very like this um yeah counter uh, yeah well um counterfactual situation um so yeah thank you very much for that um at this point it would be very nice if uh, we could hear some questions from the audience to yeah get a bit of a deeper story from um from Jenya and Manana so is there any questions are there any questions Um, I'll give you a mic. Or yeah, um, this could be for actually both the speakers, but maybe for the second presentation more. Um, that was something that was said that about the fact that if we want, we can really fasten up the uh, renewable energies uh, production, and that is really true, but that would still, maybe 2025 is really a lot of time, but that would still take at least one, two years to become energy independent, like in emergency situation, that like we are really working for it, because it's technically impossible otherwise. And in these one, two years, Russia would still have a war uh, against Ukraine, and we, we left to need to find um, a way to, to, to give energy because, so the problem is if we are putting a, a full embargo now, would that not mean that the people that are already experiencing horrible problem of energy poverty are gonna be the people that are affected? Because I, I, I agree on the fact that probably it's not gonna affect the economic system, so the production system, but it will affect people in their houses because there will be an increase of energy prices, which is also like an increase of everything prices. So the people that are already in poverty are gonna be even more affected. How can we stop that? I mean, an embargo, it's an essential thing, but how can we also prevent that the energy poverty and the poverty situation in general will spread even more because some of the countries that are sort of on the least, they had like 100% of dependency, there are already countries where poverty levels and energy poverty levels is extremely high. So how, how can we prevent this? Yeah, um, first, I don't think that I'm an expert to say what to do in this situation, but uh, also just some numbers uh, that Kremlin, until the end of the year, he's planning to have a profit uh, 14 billion uh, this year and uh, the same as uh, last year some energy companies also received like uh, XCOM I think 20 billion received profit so all this energy company received so when the uh, poverty is going it's uh, increasing a lot year by year energy com uh, companies just have an air profit a huge one year by year so uh, and I don't think that embargo would like uh, actually uh, they of course hit uh, the um, the people, but uh, I think it's like should be at the legislation level make some decisions so uh, actually to prevent and maybe to give this money that they given now to Russia give this to people so they can actually cover the um, the payment for the heating or for the gas or for the electricity and others. So they now just given this money to Russia and are not solving actually the problem here in the EU or other countries with their poverty. Uh, so there should be a solution, I think, at, at the legislation level to actually to, to support, like to prevent it and to stop it. Uh, Manana, I don't know if you also heard the question well. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 I really want to answer on this question. If you look to the repower, uh, I will plan which the commission puts. I will somehow assure you that by 25, uh, by 2025 and even more, there would be no replacement of the gas and uh, oil, uh, not only from, not all, not in general, but also from Russia. 
and uh, the, here the, there is and this debate about how to replace that is going uh, it, it's not starts with the russia's invasion in ukraine yeah russia's invasion in ukraine shows that the political decisions taken before was wrong and this was actually one of the predictions which was always made that you should not make the russia that much reach through the oil and gas uh, payments in a way that they start to renovate the Soviet Union. So now we are speaking about how to deal with the situation, what is really needed, it's the good plan, which will say that from tomorrow, when we are stopping to using oil and gas, we are not putting the money, which is the huge money is coming right now, to be invested in the new stranded assets, the new gas pipelines, new uh, interconnections, new somethings, rather than really start to do what's supposed to be done already 10 years ago, start to looking on the decentralized energy systems, like the district heatings, which is done through the, um, uh, through the deeper, different ways, which doesn't require the gas. And there is the lots of this, this type of uh, issue, um, uh, technologies. The problem is that right now, these technologies are not enough and not accessible. And this is the actual issue, how to ensure that we are not rising the energy poverty and really uh, supporting not the new nuclear, not the new gas, not the new, but really savings, new technologies, production already, uh, in a way that the people on the spot does not experience all that problems, you know. So right now it would be very difficult to like change everything together from one perspective, but from another perspective, if it would not be said very clearly that we are stopping using the oil and gas, it, that would not be changed. And the Russia, you know, tomorrow, France will be start to lobby the Russia is not that they already started actually, that is not that bad guy and we still can continue to buy the uh, gas. And then after like 10 years, the Russia again will start to uh, push. Because we are seeing the story repeatedly and repeatedly. And it's not only the Russia which is hitting the Ukraine. The Ukraine is the big country. And because, it hit, and because of this war, it's really damaged overall global system. But we recently have the same type of the war in Caucasus, which not lots of the people recognize. But at the end, we have lots of the died young people, both from the Azeri as well as from the Armenian side. Yeah. And this, this is the tragic. And then we can have another this type of the conflicts over and over. So I, I really it's important to put the money in energy savings, district heatings, and something which is not will be the stranded assets, not the new gas, no nuclear. But the problem is that the decision makers that don't believe in sustainable renewables. That's the major problem, how I read all these things, because they don't believe that the technologies exist. So everybody wants to continue as business as usual. And that was the problem before the war. And we have for the first month when the war starts, we have all hope that that can be changed, you know, understanding change. But now we are getting again, you know, it, Europe is paying the money for the uh, gas to Russia. And it, it, it's incredible. It, it, it's unhuman. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, um, that's definitely something to think about um, how like these kind of status quo decisions also very much promotes yeah the situation of crisis which is constantly perpetuating um yeah I, d I don't know if yeah okay uh, do you have a mic 
I'm going to use the privilege of having my uh, near my hand. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting presentations and inputs that that we heard over the last uh, last hour to the boss boss speakers. And thank you for being with us. And the, the, my question is, I mean, I'm not sure if uh, this is that kind of question, which is where we don't really have an answer. But I'm really interested in your in your viewpoints on this. So as we're now talking about the stopping buying of the Russian gas and oil. Um, um, and we are seeing the um, the the Western leaders, and especially I'm, I'm going to focus on the on the green leaders because I mean the green side in the government in a number of already European countries, and uh, uh, and the Ministry of Energy and the Environment is uh, one of the uh, most common portfo por portfolios for the Greens. So in many countries, the Greens are in charge to to ensure well the green transition, but also the 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 uh, energy security of a country. So this is a very difficult pos position to to be uh, right now. Uh, so and uh, we are seeing the the actions that some of them are 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 doing, and this is well. Um, trying to um, stop buying from uh, gas and oil from from Russia. Uh, of course, this is one of the things that is an aim, um, which of course is very very hard because they're not alone in the government as the Greens. There are other parties there, but this is different kind of discussion. But um, the way they are doing that, and this is something that is, um, and I, I I don't have very um, strong opinion on this. So I'm interested how you see that. Is it as a solution? Uh, we know that. Transitioning takes some time. We cannot just transition overnight, right? It would at least take a year and a two year to fully, uh, or maybe even more, but at least to have a large percentage of the renewable energy. So it, it is about, it cannot happen overnight. You know, we need infrastructure, it, it should be built. We need to find the money, which is there, I think. But all these complications which it has. But what, 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 are the, what, what is the other side is that... Um, to they're replacing, they're finding the replacement of of gas and and oil from other countries. You know, we have seen the ministers going in in Qatar, in Ara Saudi Arabia. We're talking uh, now talking about the um, lifting of the embargo from from Venezuela. So going in other also authoritarian countries to to um, replace the Russian gas and oil. So which on the one hand is understandable uh, in a sense that it's. Um, it's very bad to be dependent on one big player, uh, especially right, like Russia, you know. Um, almost a global power is a nuclear uh, um, uh, energy, um, not energy, but bombs. Um, but so, um, how do you see that? Is um, what, what can be done to stop um, embargo, and um, to do embargo of Russian gas and oil, but also is, is this, is, is going to some other authoritarian countries uh, a solution? And how should we, especially from the green perspective, uh, uh, what should we do to um, uh, start embargo as soon as possible? And if this could be one of the solutions, um, going to other uh, authoritarian countries which have um, gas and oil and try to replace through that way. Uh. Manana, you've been <laughs> chosen <laughs> to start first with this okay. difficult question. Yeah, um, the, the, uh, if the gas would not be recognized by the taxonomy as a transition uh, fuel, and the same with the nuclear, uh, then I would be maybe more easy for like replacement, yeah? But here, what we see now, we see very active engagement with the new infrastructure. So, so and at the end of the day, this diversification is supposed to be happened like, I don't know, like maybe 10 years ago, yeah. Now it's, uh, from my perspective, there should be very short term uh, plan, which will replace when we take the, now the decision to stop the buy the, from Russia, oil and gas, very short replacement, all, and which means also there is not enough resources uh, because when we speak now about replacement, we're speaking about increased uh, 
oil and gas extraction, which from climate point of view is really disaster because the Russia is not, for, at, at least for the next five years, they would not stop that, yeah? And they will continue to supply it with Asia. So what if the European Union is really serious to be the leader, we need the plan which will simply tries to replace, not to develop the new gas and, and start to do the savings and savings and efficiency and efficiency and switching. And it can be if there is the political will of all countries, and I, I really specify the all countries, because lots of the countries want to continue as they have been. It's why there is so many problems. Uh, with the fifth packet of the sanctions, you know, because nobody wants to lose anything. And, but in this situation, uh, short term losses should not be transformed in the long term lose, you know. We need to really transform the short term losses in the long term benefits. And that should be very clear. And you should act as the one uh, actor, because if we speak about the energy poverty, you know, here is that, you know, the old member states will be quite okay if that happen, if the Ra Russia gas embargo will happen, but not the new member states. And how the old member state will support the new uh, member states? What, do we see any solidarity action in really, how to say, prescribed. Of course, I, I'm sorry that I'm speaking too much. I have and I have no very like clearly developed recipe, but there is, I'm I'm pretty sure that there is really very good recipes done by the, by the different organizations and by different think tanks. And we can put everything together. But what is Genia was really stressing about the political will. This is really important, you know, to have the political will, not only to say, we need to say bye bye Russian oil and gas, and but not welcoming the Venezuela and Saudi increasing the oil production, you know, just buy what they have, but not increasing. Because the new, if the now, what now is happening, the company is going to Venezuela to start the new drillings. So, and, and can you imagine how many years their lobby will try to continue to sell that oil on the US or in the European market? So it should be, once decision should be taken that not like it happens in taxonomy, but very clear decisions should be taken with very clear goals or unless 2030 um, goals would not be reached. It's not possible, you know, by help, help, um, going up and down all time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, Jenny, it would be also interesting to hear a bit from you and maybe also to build upon what you said uh, and to put another layer to the question, which already isn't very easy. Um, how do you think we can achieve this change and also in the long term, kind of not to return to this status quo. Because right now, even if we're not really happy with uh, what's being done in this energy transformation, I think that in Europe, there's this feeling of, uh, okay, it's kind of a crisis mode. We need to make some serious changes. Uh, so how to how to keep this momentum? Uh, if you can also reflect on that, that would be very interesting. Uh, when the war began uh, in Twitter, been like a flash mob, let's say, uh, so the people in Germany, I think, but maybe not only in Germany, in EU probably, people are turn off the heating in the apartment. Uh, and actually, there have been um, uh, already some researches, so it's possible to actually have embargo on a whole fossil fuel uh, just with resources that uh, here here now in the EU, just with, uh, I can share after the video for, for the participants. Uh, like uh, during uh, next months, uh, like the governments uh, should like focus on energy efficiency, try to raise renewables as much as it possible, 
uh, plus uh, reduce the consumption. And uh, like now I moved to uh, Europe uh, like during the last uh, two months and actually I see the difference between Ukraine, how many waste, for example, I had and how many uh, I produce in Europe. Uh, it's like probably twice or more. Uh, there's like a lot of plex, uh, plastics and so on, and I even don't have a chance to like I don't have a lot of al alter alternatives when I go into the supermarket. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of way to do it. Uh, there is no political way uh, uh, willing to to do that. Uh, so we still continue to like as Manana say, like continue to do business as usual. There is like a lot of lobby, a lot of interest to, to continue to do the same. Uh, but uh, when we speak about embargo, like for for the Ukraine now, mostly we, we of course, we understand that uh, Ukraine don't want to, I don't know, cut the whole of Europe from heating during the winter and, uh, I don't know, leave how whatever you want of course no uh we just uh support and to not give this money to russia now so at least they would like lose the huge amount of money currently and it can like be a break moment to actually the change uh, the the way how the war is going uh happening now and all this money for example just in three uh, uh, it was like uh, 60 billion, it was on 100 day of war. So they give like 60 billion. I think uh, I never saw any reports that uh, you or any countries gave so much money to the renewables energy. So can you imagine if this money would go to the new technology, to the researches, to the real investment in renewables? So actually it would like uh, change so much the situation with... Uh, uh, developing renewables, energy efficiency, uh, clean technology, just transition and other stuff. So there, uh, there is a solutions and uh, there is like a lot of reports, uh, researches. Uh, just yeah, nobody wants to listen, and there is still like balancing between uh, green, green vision and business as usual and uh, energy companies. So that's why we still like don't move forward to actually to that goals that we put in the future for 2050. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Jenya. Um, well, we're getting uh, a bit short with time, so I would like to tell you a bit kind of about my conclusions from this discussion, uh, which is one first conclusion which you maybe also came in with here today is that we have very little time to make kind of a tectonic shift in our energy paradigms and energy systems. Um, and basically to achieve this, we what we need is a new social agreement on uh, actually being serious to making kind of this, um, this switch um, in the way that we produce and consume energy. Uh, and there are definitely going to be some short-term losses in this transition but it also has a huge, huge potential to unlock um, uh, to unlock uh, environmental um, shift uh, and kind of a yeah a new environmental um, system, as well as uh, unlocking kind of radical geopolitical um, breakthroughs. So hopefully that's something. One of those are some of the things that you're taking home uh, after this session. Um, and yeah, thank you, Genia. Thank you, Manana, for uh, for your input, and thank you, everyone, for sticking around for the session. Uh, but even though the panel itself start stops, the session doesn't. And Gio <laughs> can tell us a bit more about this. What we move on to? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, we move on with. Um, so we we talked about uh, energy, and um, on the first session there was a lot of discussion about the centralization of energy as a, as a problem. Uh, even even the renewable energy, if if it's centralized, we have a problems there. Um, so we now move on with the presentation and the workshop um, about energy cooperatives. So we have we will have a small presentation now, and then we will have a workshop. I mean, it's a workshop um, um, about um, from from uh, Electro Energy, and that is energy cooperative in Greece. And uh, Sandy is with us, um, who will be doing um, the workshop. So 
Uh, we smoothly move on with uh, with the workshop. Okay, it feels strange that I'm alone up here. <laughs> um, but it, it's fine, we're gonna talk about something. No, <laughs> no, 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 it's really fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about solutions. Uh, we be, we've been having uh, some really interesting discussions today. And uh, at the last panel, we circled around solutions and embargo and renewables and stuff like that. So I'm here with a solution. <laughs> this is the, the good part. Um, I will try to make it short and adapt to the time remaining. So we will have a shorter workshop, but I'm sure it's going to help you and inspire you maybe uh, for ideas on how you can work on um, energy democracy, as we say it. So just a few things about Electra. Electra is a social enterprise and we work um, towards a, a just, green and sustainable energy system, uh, which will have people on the center instead of profit and big companies, which is Nice. Um, we try to share information and knowledge that we have acquired over the years. Uh, this is why I'm here, <laughs> actually. And for example, if anyone is interested in traveling again in a few weeks, we will have a summer school on how to build a, an energy movement, a citizen energy movement uh, in uh, northern Greece. It's going to take place. And it's... Um, uh, it will be for Balkan countries mostly, but everyone is invited. Uh, so we try to bridge the gap between the knowledge that the, uh, the Western North uh, Europe has instead of the Southern Eastern. Uh, and we know that, and we, were, we are poor countries in the East. <laughs> Greece is one of them. So it's uh, interesting to cooperate and try to develop together. So, just to get the context before I dive in what energy communities are. As may, have, may you, you know, many of you or everyone, um, there, ha there have been some developments, political, political, political decisions and uh, directives and uh, laws that actually enable renewables and renewable sources of energy to grow. Uh, for example, we have the Paris Agreement with the uh, infamous climate goals. We have the um, uh, sustainable development goals, and uh, especially the goal seven, which is about uh, accessible, clean, and uh, energy for all. Uh, some others, okay. It's more of a national thing there next to. But we have the, um, the recent Repower EU, which has a, an extensive solar uh, strategy and the solar rooftops initiative and energy communities for the first time as an obligation kind of way. Uh, so we were trying to see what's going on there. And of course the taxonomy uh, that is going to affect the development of res uh, highly. So <laughs> the, the turning point for energy communities was the package of directives for uh, clean energy for all Europeans back in 2018. Uh, it was the first time that energy communities was recogni were recognized as legal entities and were given as an option for, um, for legal frameworks to adopt them or for citizens to get to know uh, that uh, collective energy is actually feasible. Uh, this was the time that Greece adopted the idea of energy communities into its uh, legal framework. And we're talking again about the poor country. It's not easy uh, for, um, for not a, you know, a mass, massive uh, and power country controlling one, or I don't know, uh, to adopt them. But for a small country with a huge economical crisis, it's not that easy, but we did it. And the reason I'm saying that is because uh, we all ha get to um, to work on these things because um, energy communities are cooperatives. So uh, the real thing is that 
not the the governments don't have the obligation to actually develop them. You just give the opportunity for citizens to to be a part of um, of the energy transition and to form these alliances, as we say. Uh, the spectrum of activities is on renewable sources of energy. We will see them in detail um, later on. There are democratic entities because each one of the member has a vote and is equal to the others. And it can be profit or non-profit, it's up to, to them. And members can be natural persons, like citizens, like us, legal entities, small businesses, municipalities, like everyone that is actually part of a society. You can, uh, you can operate on selling, on self-consumption, energy savings and efficiency, which is the first step to uh, an energy transition that's gonna actually succeed. Uh, on education, on uh, mobility, um, I mean electric mobility of course, and uh, storage and distribution. So as you can see is everything that is, um, uh, that is referring to the energy system and it's now open for everyone to join. We're not talking about um, um, a closed sector anymore. Um, the, the, um, the po po I will find the word, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the good thing is <laughs> that um, uh, we decide about God what's going on. We can be prosumers, which means that we can produce and consume the energy ourselves. This is, um, this is a, a tool to tackle energy poverty and to join the, the fight against climate change. And to follow up on the, on the panel, it is a way to actually um, cut ourselves from fossil fuels and decide uh, which source we're going to use. So it's it's kind of an embargo to fossil fuels that we can uh, implement ourselves and not expect any government or I don't know a nation taking a huge decision to change the uh, the system. We actually push the change to happen ourselves. Um, it's very innovative. It um, it enables uh, the local economies to grow and to flourish and uh, we achieve energy security, so we do not, uh, we no longer wait for a subsidy or w worry about the energy prices rising because let's not forget that gas is now a stock market product. So it's never gonna be a stable one. And we give like billions of euros to subsidies to support fossil fuels. This is, these are a lot of money. And these are money uh, that the consumers actually pay. So this is why we do not get to predict what our bills are gonna be. Uh, but this way, if we can produce our own energy, we can. Waiting for the picture. <laughs> no worries. Um, of course, it's an entity that works as a business, so you need to have a business plan uh, in order to uh, give the members the safety of uh, knowing what's going to happen and what the revenues are going to have, and it's, it uh, develops confidence. Uh, it's an easy way to have access to your financial um, uh, ways and to recognize the weaknesses you have and to um, promote um, improvements to it. So this is yeah. These are special characteristics. I'm gonna go through them quickly because, as I said before, an energy community actually decides for itself. Uh, you can, uh, and usually people want to be transparent, of course, and want to form alliances in order to become stronger. And uh, they are ac they are usually very inclusive. And the way I say that is because uh, there was uh, research. Uh, conducted in Greece to see how many women actually participate in uh, energy communities. And we found out that even though the energy communities want women to be part of them, of course, um, we saw that on the board of, of, the board of directors, there were, uh, there were less, like uh, for 76%, for there were like zero or only one uh, women uh, participating. Uh, 
this gets to change. And we have some very good examples. I'm going to go through them later. Um, um, this can be changed because you get to decide who you work with. At the moment, we have more than 1,000 registered energy communities. Most of them are in, in uh, lignite areas, which is really nice. It means that the people that are affected by fossil fuel industry want to make this change and want to push it to happen. Uh, we have uh, we have 4,066 4, megawatts uh, installed already, and many many more applications for uh, for um, for projects uh, in just a few years. It's only been four years since we adopted the idea of the energy communities, and we had the frame framework. And we had some trouble at first because it wasn't easy to register an energy community. Still, we have some obstacles. But in four years, to have installments this high, it means that we can do it. I mean, it is possible. So I was talking about some examples before. Uh, we have four examples of energy communities, very different uh, one to another. Uh, when Coop, is uh, the first energy community that has uh, women only as members. Uh, there are like 500 women now. I'm, I'm not sure that I remember the number correctly, but it's a very big energy community and it uh, actually empowers women to uh, join the energy sector. Um, we have uh, ESEC. It's, um, it's a very inclusive, also, uh, energy community, uh, and they work with uh, with farmers mostly, and uh, and other sectors that are flourishing in the area. Uh, they actually form the alliance to grow stronger. Uh, Minoan Energy uh, in Crete, you see the island there. Uh, they actually have municipalities as members, but it was a municipality-driven initiative. There were citizens that grew more and more, and then, um, and then municipalities and authorities actually um, paid attention to them and wanted to join. So now it's a, it's a huge community, and they do lots of stuff. And Hyperion, based in Athens, it's the first social um, and social solar community that actually uh, gets to do collective self-consumption, which means they have a park and they share the, the, the energy. And they, uh, they, will, um, they already have some members, uh, uh, some energy poor households, and they gave out the uh, offers for free, actually, and they, go they want to grow more. I don't know what I'm telling this in plural. I mean, I am a member of, of Hyperion, so we <laughs> are going to go uh, bigger and um, try to include many, many more. So the global trend, as we say, is that we have uh, active citizens, that we have clean energy, we have um, a democratic uh, energy system, and energy communities actually meet all these expectations, as I said before, which is good. <laughs> okay, this, uh, I'm gonna go back. These were just examples of uh, some toolkits we had, but we are short on time. Uh, the, the exercise that I want to do now is, as I told you, it wasn't easy to adopt the framework. It wasn't easy at first to build an energy community and get it to operate. Uh, but we have over overcome, overcame some of the obstacles, and we have the answers. So now I just want you, like, to, yeah, let's have two groups, and we're, you're almost the same number, and try to think about obstacles that apply to your countries, to your uh, societies, and stuff like that, from lack of uh, framework to I don't know how to convince people to join an energy community, something like that. Um, and I, I want you just to, to write down all the obstacles and problems, and then we will discuss them and find solutions. Um, so yeah, something like that. <laughs> I'm sorry it applies only to the person, to the people that are here, <laughs> in order to discuss them. Thank you. Questions?
think especially then the war started, uh, like the full-scale invasion started. Uh, for now, it's, it's uh, like for Ukraine, it's uh, pretty will be pretty pretty uh, very relevant. For example, it is. Um, you always, uh, especially if you are near the like front line, is uh, you are always in danger that uh, some, for example, electricity, like you don't have electricity, you might have, you don't have a gas, you don't have a heating, you don't have a hot water. So, and uh, I think so many people started to dream to have something like uh, your own. So I hope it will be in Ukraine after the war. It will be more easier to like uh, continue this such a way of development. So. We had this obstacle, but now, like uh, the situation, show how it can be unsecure for every person to to be very dependent from the centralized uh, communications. Mm, yeah, th that's that's true. I mean, um, you have more problems at the moment, so I see your point, of course. Uh, but another thing is that, yeah, if we go independent, then it's easier for us. We have, uh, I, I mean in a central level, but in a, in a very personal level as well. Uh, so I get your point. I hope that you overcome your obstacles as well. I, I actually hope that they weren't, like, now. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, and um, energy communities actually help with the decentralized energy and, uh, and a very stable energy system as well. So it's a solution for everything, almost, regarding the energy, of course. Um, any, any more questions before we, we go with, with the groups? Because then we have to say goodbye to our uh, people who are watching us online and are not uh, here. So if there's any more questions, we can take a question and then we can move on with the group work. OK, no more questions. Uh, uh, good. Um, so yeah, thank you to, to, to those who have been watching uh, the, the session. And well, since it, it is the end of the first day of the conference, so thanks who have been uh, with us online um, for the whole day. Um, and yeah, tomorrow, see you tomorrow. Uh, we have only one session planned to be live streamed, which is the last session for, for tomorrow, which is which should give us hope because we live in a very difficult times, as I said in the in the beginning of the conference. But in these difficult times, there still is a hope, hope for a better world, hope for peace, for and hope for a green transition and the green world. And tomorrow we'll be discussing the emerging green political parties that are delivering already the change in their own communities and their own countries, and we are seeing them in action. So tomorrow, I hope we will get bit more hopeful in this difficult time, so definitely mm, join us uh, at uh, 5.30 Eastern European time. Um, so see you tomorrow, and now we can continue with, uh, with the group work.